Hello everyone, today we talk about the early 17th century Medicine attempts of recovering Jerusalem, right? Which sounds pretty bizarre, it's not a very popular story, but these things actually happened back in the day. I think uh, it's interesting to start expanding in 16th, 17th, 18th century warfare strategy, and especially the great struggle between the Ottoman Empire and most Christian powers, but essentially explaining how this uh, subdivision is you know, very simplistic and uh, observing how uh, these wars were growing fundamentally with you know in, in conflict with each other largely but also with a lot of cultural intersections of interest towards each other and uh, hybridizing right as it always happens when with warfare actually that as we often say is the most powerful uh, hybridizers of civilizations as much as its greatest potential uh, destructor right and the history of Europe at this point at the early 17th century as you realize is still far from the um, sta centralized state model Europe is, is very fragmented in part it is the the strength of Europe itself right um, the Ottoman Empire in its might and greatness also had conversely other problems um, like having uh, almost all the times three or four fronts open right consuming this enormous amount of resources and what we see here today is exactly one of these example has a small power like the Grand Duchy of Tuscany in the early seven, uh, 17th century was you know, effectively capable of attempting, albeit with not much of a result, as we will see, to put it mildly, um, uh, an attack um, with the objective to reconquer, nonetheless, then effectively Constantinople, right? And start. This is actually, I tell you, it's a part of a new series that I'm starting. So we will observe uh, lots of other examples like this. Uh, there are many interesting ones, with, for example, with the Gonzaga Never. Uh, that attempted, uh, you know, or exactly at the beginning of the 17th century, kind of put uh, a little bit aside their um, adventures and courtly dream of the crusade. They they also kind of, you know, uh, compensated with this by creating other uh, chivalric orders, like the one of the redemption that, aside from the past, for example, didn't um, that accompanied its birth, didn't actually, you know, have. Uh, any life, right? All this war that is still very, very tormented, spiritually speaking, and and politically, at the same time. So the Tuscan example, I think, it's fascinating. Um, it, it is connected largely also to the history of another chivalric order that well had a pretty marked uh, maritime character, right? Uh, just like the one of the uh, Ioannites of of Malta, the and the Knights of St. John, that was effectively the Tuscan one of, uh, of St. Stephen, right? Uh, Ferdinand I of the Medici was uh, very close to the papal court at the time, also because he had been uh, a cardinal since, as Grand Duke of Tuscany, he detained this um, title that had been conceded uh, to his father Cosimo I uh, by the Pope uh, Pius V, and that had also created problems with with Spain, right? Because the Spanish had refused initially to recognize it, and you know, against their will, <laughs> they eventually had to, in 1576. Um, uh, think of, of the picture here. I mean, uh, the wars of Italy are are over, so Spain exercises a pretty strong uh, control on um, even those parts of Italy that uh, it, it has not directly occupied like the the kingdom of Naples or the Milanesado as it was known uh, in Spanish so the era of Milan that had been the main objects of contention um, with the French so the the, the Manish at this point were fundamentally you know within the, the, the Spanish you know orbit but at the same time exactly at this point when also the the Spanish power was still you know at its at its height but somewhat redimension itself was trying to um, reacquire a bit of more of a of independence also in their political I mean in their international policy um, Ferdinand the first especially um, couldn't suffer 
um, this, um, you know, hegemonic uh, policy of the crown of Spain, right? Because albeit Tuscany was an imperial vassal, right? So here, yes, of course, the Habsburgs are present both uh, in, in as Holy Roman emperors and kings uh, of Spain, but, you know, the two branches now have already split. But there was this strange situation for which Tuscany w was part of the Holy Roman Empire, um, but at the same time, uh, Cosimo de' Medici back in the day had received um, in fief the Siena's uh, territory, the territory of Siena, the Duchy of Siena, by Philip II of Habsburg, uh, King of Spain, right? And, and w w Spain that still detained very important maritime strongholds such as the ones of uh, Orbetello, Porto Ercole, Porto Santo Stefano, Talamone. Ancedonia and Porto Langone that were this um, important uh, uh, coastal, you know, bases that fundamentally had built up the so-called Stato dei Presidi that was in Spanish control, right? So there's, there was this situation um, in which uh, Tuscany that had a, a fairly good potential on the Tyrrhenian Sea from a maritime point of view had been fundamentally impeded by the Spanish control of some of the, the, the its most, uh, you know, uh, important uh, ports, especially fr from a strictly strategical point of view. Uh, Consider that here uh, we're talking about the, the age of privateering, like Christians and Muslims are constantly fighting uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, Italy is just next door to the Ottoman Balkans, right? And especially it has the, the problem of the Italian states they have to control this um, astonishingly long um, co uh, coastal trades, like Italy has something like more than 3,000 kilometers of coasts. Um, so this was a, a put a lot of strains on the strategical effort of the Italian states because they were already basically knocked out of the game as independent powers since the Italian wars and still they had to contribute. Uh, in very importantly, especially from a naval point of view, think about the Battle of Lepanto that was, you know, largely, you know, uh, fought with and won by the Christians with uh, the the Italian naval naval power. Um, so this this is a very complicated uh, picture that today we don't have the time to to really t to deepen since this has literally to do with all European international policy. It's very, very, very complicated, but it will expl uh, expand on this on other, uh, on other videos. We will talk extensively about the Thirty Years' War, looking at other, uh, other environments. Um, but, um, so, the important today we discuss is what Ferdinand de Medici did, uh, trying to free himself, in all possible ways, let's say, um, from the Iberian tutelage right so the heavy Spanish influence and one of these actions was to actually concede in 1600 um, his uh, uh, n um, nephew um, Mary right uh, daughter of his um, deceased brother Fra Francis the first to Henry the fourth uh, of France quite famously Maria de Medici being you know uh, the Sun King's uh, grandmother, um, and uh, so in this moment in which France has basically come out of the, the, the terribly tearing uh, moment of the wars of religion, as you know with Henry IV of Bourbon, that was, you know, the, the leader of the Protestants by definition since the beginning of the struggles, he, you know, basically accepted um, the French crown I in exchange for his Catholicization, hence how the, the Bourbon also arrived on the throne and began, began to reign. So Henry IV, other enormous figure, and, uh, and of a France that was recompacting um, after, you know, the, uh, after having basically lost the Italian wars and having been engulfed with this uh, dreadful confessional uh, wars in fact um, and this naturally was a big problem for Spain as you understand and therefore the Medici were clever enough now to ally with, with the French still formally um, and kind of becoming more th their protege in or at least going towards that direction but um, these new diplomatic hor horizons could not be enough Ferdinand wanted to achieve 
something greater than that, right? Uh, it's a bit the obsession of the rulers of the early 17th century that are struggling uh, in a world that always remember that this is the moment in which Western, the Western world has literally lost the plot in the sense that after the discovery of the New World and the Reformation and uh, this uh, terrible, you know, uh, uh, wars that are being fought either internally to Christianity or because of the Ottoman invasion has, you know, uh, it's the, the, the picture of Baroque in itself. I mean, this idea of the lack of a center, right? Even think about the same uh, heliocentric astronomic theories that are showing that effectively the Earth is not at the center of the universe. So really a lot, even just from intellectual point of view, is changing. The 17th century is an astonishingly beautiful... Uh, basically everything that happened in the 18th century had been already formulated philosophically in, in, in the century before, right? And in, in, let's say in the political theory in some cases this um, this attitude brought to the idea of the superiorem non recognoscence, that is to say uh, that uh, in this uh, lack in a center, every sovereign thought uh, at that point it could be th the next head of even of Christianity. Think in this sense, even how the thing was interpreted from a confessional point of view. Even if you look in, in the art of the time, like sovereigns like the one, I don't know, Sweden or Spain, that were thinking them to be the new leading powers because they were from their own confessional side. Of course, they re they deemed to be the, the right one. And uh, with a with a an empire and, and a papacy that were ever less uh, meaningful, and so um, a lot of these experimentations, um, and Ferdinand especially was aiming at something clamorous like getting a new territory of some sort, right? Uh, since for the Manichae this could have allowed uh, it was the only option basically to carry uh, on further, right? The uh, a s s a safe dynastic policy it was not influenced by major powers and it's very interesting because the managing here given uh, their the maritime character of Tuscany had thought um, cons insistently actually to Africa and even to the New World especially to Brazil right but actually for for an Italian power the most uh, the, I mean the closest um, uh, objectives in many ways were still the Mediterranean ones uh, in order to which Ferdinand had ca that you know by in order to, to achieve them counted um, on actually a good seafaring um, that he, he he controlled that is the one of the of St. Stephen's Knights right that were essentially set in the uh, Medician port of Livorno that had been fairly a new construction and built exactly in this, uh, yeah, in this, I mean, pr maritime projection mm, uh, strategy of, of the Medici. Um, that, um, I mean, Knights of St. Stephen were committed into this endemic uh, privateering war against the Turkish uh, uh, and especially uh, barbaric uh, vessels, right? So, as, as you understand here, um, uh, the 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 strategic situation in the Mediterranean is very very fascinating. As you know, the Battle of Lepanto is, is a, a, a clamorous victory by every stretch of imagination, uh, brought to important strategical um, transformations, but still didn't settle right the matter uh, between the, the Christians um, and the Muslims in, in the Mediterranean, especially. Uh, the Ottoman Empire is so articulated, has such a great influence, has also along the coast of North Africa. This is very diverse, politically speaking, actually, as we will see now. Uh, this, I mean, capacity of sending in, um, in the Western Mediterranean, this, uh, in fact, barbaric, I mean, from Barbaria, Barbary, um, all these um, pirates, these raiders, uh, privateers proper sometimes, I mean, what sometimes you can't even tell the difference. Um, and uh, the Medici, uh, as Christian rulers, were naturally m m matching perfectly the idea of the policy, of the crusade policy, right? Um, that uh, was backing actively, in fact, the Order of Saint Stephen, right? And it, and this strategy actually had a, a certain coherence, right? Um, 
we, we we're saying what the hell did what the task can do at this point? Well, you know, between in this immediate strategical goal of 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 Christi uh, let's say of those who were fighting against the Ottomans between the the seven uh, the sixteenth and the seventeenth century, especially after that Spain seemed to be temporarily you know come out, right, um, pulled out of the commitment against the Ottomans, right, because this. This was his history of a loss, right? The, the Spanish lost a lot, actually, of, of centers around the North African coast. It was a much greater commitment than, than before. Um, this had somewhat also overstretched the, the Ottoman control, so there were still more gaps to, you know, to, to fill in, in some ways. Um, and and the Christian powers at this point, especially from from an uh, you know from a naval dimension, um, had the interest to fraction uh, the um the intervention on several fronts right so attacking the ottomans in in many places at once by sea um and as a consequence lightening the pressure that the turks were you know exercising on uh hungary and also on what still remained of the venetian possessions in, in mediterranean because the habsburgs of austria and venice were you know, by by for obvious reasons, the most committed um, against the uh, I mean, uh, in the fight against the Ottomans. Uh, this is also another kind of bitter realization of the men of the time that uh, yeah, I mean, we are all more or less under the Habsburgs here in the south. We all have common interests, but what does Spain do, right? What does Austria? Do? I mean, sometimes they follow very different policies. Um, Venice does as well. I mean, they all have that. That's the fragmentation we were talking about before, right? It's this scrupulousless uh, realpolitik that characterizes also in a certain way the uh, the seventeenth century, what will grow in, uh, essentially as an increasingly secularized um, moment. I mean, period in history, albeit as we see here. The idea of crusade was still totally alive, right? If you think that y the Christian aristocrats were out of that uh, mindset, you're completely wrong. We've seen it, especially even with the uh, the, the Prince uh, uh, Eugen Sirius, that uh, you know, uh, especially from from the Austrian point of view, that was the first uh, the first duty in some ways. There was also a race that the privateering war was was fueling but by itself as it was a you know a remunerative uh, affair like these orders like the knights of saint stephen were also directed at uh, raiding um men to to make uh, slaves uh weaponry like when they seized uh, the enemy vessels they obviously took all their their guns for not talking about the goods right especially on the route between alexandria uh, and constantinople over which Past, especially the very important tributes were collected uh, in Egypt for the Ottoman fisc, and this was one of the most coveted routes for the European privateering war. And the Order of Saint Stephen, ever since its foundation, had uh, obtained a, a very uh, remarkable set of victories at sea over the infidels, right? Um, in reality, however, this was complicating the same Medicean policy, right? Um, in fact, uh, the, the Tuscans in this regard were, were divided. Um, the, the Grand Duchy, as basically uh, almost all of Europe at that time, was suffering a strong economical crisis um, from which, objectively, Tuscany could recover only by increasing trade with, um, with the East, right? Uh, because let's be honest about this, the Italians always traded, especially with uh, with the Muslim powers. But throughout all the, the Crusades, like especially to take the Venetians, these intense relations with countries like like um, Egypt, um, Syria, but even with closer uh, Tunisia, right? So this um, emphasis, this uh, impetus of the Saint Stephen Knights. Uh, of Tuscany also impeded de facto those that would have been those florid commercial relations that uh, surely didn't didn't lack uh, even uh, with the presence of the knights themselves um, between 
Livorno and uh, the, the same Livorno where the, the knights were based and centers in fact like Alexandria, uh, Tunisia, but also Algeria, you, you know, so um, in there were many uh, in within the same Medicean court actually that um, were against for the reasons we have exposed against the maritime policy of the Grand Duke and of his knights, right? The same wife of Ferdinand, Christine of Lorraine, didn't make any, you know, uh, effort to, to, to conceal the subversion. Um, and so there was this important expedition in 1601 uh, that had to be a bit the, the trial for the, the prosecution of this policy that committed the uh, Knights of Malta and the ones of St. Stephen um, in support of Philip III of Spain, right? And it was this uh, fleet of 70 galleys at the command of the Genoese uh, Gian Andrea Doria that um, was uh, sent to defeat the Capudan Pasha Cigala, right? Uh, in order to occupy the usual Algeri against uh, which you know so so many attempts had already already tried so um, the way the, the, the operation was planned was essentially taking um, uh, grants from uh, a certain uh, renegades within Algeri that would have to uh, open the gates or at least backed uh, supported the conquest, but this whole enterprise ended up in a true fiasco as on August the 25th the Christian fleet arrived in f uh, off of Algeri, but basically there was no signal whatsoever of any cooperation from the uh, conspirators um, and basically all that Doria could do was to take back his ships uh, to to Messina and yeah the, the whole thing uh, was blow, uh, blown up definitely. So the great duke at that point had hoped uh, to also reintertwine in some ways the relations with the Spanish crown that as we have seen had been uh, actually they were already compromised for a series of reasons now we don't have time to explain and however worsened by the marriage between Henry of France and Maria de Medici. Um, and, and therefore the whole Algeria expedition was a, a very important chance lost to establish also some, you know, foreground position of the Grand Dutch in front of the Spanish to, you know, maybe entrust Ferdinand more, you know, more tasks, more, more autonomy of action. Um, and in these years, Ferdinand was also uh, aging, you know, his health was somewhat worsening. And also for the fact that his son wasn't uh, about to, to settle down, also the other cadet's son were actually prevented from making advantageous marriages that could fundamentally um, create an unbalance in the, the, you know, dynastic line in terms of power and possible and these and things like these um, and, th and therefore Ferdinand attempted speedier more hasty uh, paths uh, apt to procure to him new territorial possessions to leave um, as, a, as an inheritance um, so he still uh, bet on the crusading horse let's say as the Grand Duke attempted first of all to ally with the uh, most, um, you know, the, the greatest Muslim adversaries of the uh, Padishah, that is essentially the uh, the, the Saudite Sultan of M Morocco, Al Mansur, then the Shah um, Abbas of Persia, that were at war with the Sublime Gate, um, and that were, you know, already open essentially and uh, available to. Uh, find with an agreement with the the Christians in the West, uh, and to carry out some operations that could f fundamentally enact a pincer movement uh, capable of um, choking 
uh, the, the Turk. So the negotiations, especially with the Maghrebin dynast, didn't lead to to any relevant result. While the uh, once with the Persian uh, emperor, albeit carry on, you know, speedily, uh, were uh, you know stranded on a very important uh, rock that seemed to be unsur unsurmountable as um, basically the conflict between the Safavids and the Ottomans had uh, uh, arrived to a stalemate in which nor the Turks nor the Persians managed to overcome uh, the other. Uh, in the meanwhile, however, towards the end of 1606, uh, Europe was reached by the news of the rebellion uh, to uh, the uh, Sultan of the Aleppo Pasha, uh, Ali Yambulat, um, to which wa was also to whom was also signing another figure, the Druze, uh, uh, the Druze Emir of Lebanon, Fakr ad-Din of the noble dynasty of the Mahan, who had um, e entered in contact actually with the great uh, Grand Duke of Tuscany through especially the, the, good, the good work of a Venetian nobleman called Raffaello Cacciamani, who was a very you know, um, skilled um, uh, diplomat, let's put it in this way. At Ferdinand at this point was fundamentally uh, impatient, either because he feared to, to die uh, soon, but he seemed to be infatuated now with not just to in obtaining some territorial acquisition, but also to you know to expand in the east and even to aspire to a crown that actually was non-existent at the time, that was however formally very contested uh, within the westerners by the various pretendants since it was basically the, the most prestigious uh, of all in a certain sense that was the one of the ancient crusader kingdom of Jerusalem right um, since in the Christian world um, through the games of inheritances and the uh, relative claims right on um, dynastic possessions etc uh, et uh, there was this for still this formal claim coming from very important uh, players in the politics of the time, starting from the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, the King of Spain, the one of France, and also by the Duke of Savoy. Um, and all of these claims were aleatory, right? This was just essentially a feudal problem among the Westerners, saying, you know, dynastically speaking, who did, uh, you know, have the right to the legacy of the Kingdom of Jerusalem? Doesn't matter that now the Muslims had conquered it, that nobody effectively cared or even planned to recover it. Uh, um, but the Tuscan sovereign um, could at least reasonably think that uh, in front of an unaccomplished reconquest of Jerusalem, as you know, crazy as it could sound, uh, could sound from a strategical point of view in those situations, um, could have essentially accepted uh, his throne on Jerusalem and basically living it like that, right? Um, the possession of which also wasn't much of a like this thing could even fail at the end. But if just the Tuscans had managed to recover Jerusalem for some time, we will see uh, there was some possibility, uh, maybe, uh, especially through the help of the Aleppo rebels. Um, at least that recognition could could give to to the grand duchy uh, uh, you know a great uh, legacy right um and the hemp the holy roman emperor at this time had signed a truce with the ottomans and he was pretty busy in reorganizing uh, his danubian territories um the spanish now were suffering pretty bitterly from uh since you know the the Spanish maritime power uh, had been kneeling in front of uh, the uh, Elizabeth the first uh, England uh, from France that also was uh, ruled by as we have seen 
the uh, the groom of his, one of his nephews, Ferdinand, uh, was expecting some sort of support, while Savoy, by this time, could have not uh, obstacled in any ways this this uh, enterprise, if not by protesting and maintaining the Jerusalemitan insignia in 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 their coat of arms, but you know and yeah, uh, claiming the relative title in, in their chancery documents, but what else? Um, so this was a, a totally, like, if you think about it, for, as we were saying before, from a strategical point of view, it sounds absurd, right? Uh, a power of, I would say, of third, well, s between second and third class, like Tuscany at that point, could essentially organized this expedition to reconquer Jerusalem, not really in the heart of the Ottoman Empire, still in a peripheral uh, area, and especially in a situation of internal, you know, um, you know, crisis with the revolt of Syria and Lebanon, uh, was still a pretty bizarre thing to, to, to achieve, right? And still the Mediterranean, I mean, the Eastern Mediterranean was patrolled and controlled by, by the Ottomans. I mean, everything was very, very risky. Um, and um, at the same time, uh, the uh, really the Medici started thinking pretty seriously about this, and they also started to realize that this enterprise could have opened to them to two other uh, two other possessions eventually. For example, what about Cyprus? Cyprus had fallen from a few decades into the Turkish hands. I've talked a lot about Cyprus also in our medieval history videos. Basically, between the 12th and the 15th century, the island had belonged to the uh, French dynasty, albeit vassal of the um, kings of England that were also dukes of Aquitaine. We're talking about the Lusignan, right? Um, that had um, held, uh, you know, uh, formally re with recognition, the royal title. Um, of Cyprus, but also of Jerusalem combined, right? Uh, even after uh, the the loss of Jerusalem, as we know, in 1187, we have talked about the Battle of Hattin just a few days ago. So, uh, Cyprus, as we also have seen in other um, occasions, had passed first in the hands of of the Genoese, and eventually, in one of the Venetians specifically through the last queen consort of uh, Lusignan, the Venetian Catherine Corner, right, Caterina Corner. Um, and uh, Cyprus had fallen um, in, in the Ottoman hands um, in 1570. Uh, but there was this voice that uh, fundamentally the, uh, the malcontent um, spread uh, coat on, especially among the uh, Greek population of the island, which seemingly actually ex post was was not truly really true, right? But the the local Greek Orthodox were yeah they weren't happy about the Ottoman presence, but in some ways it was better an Islamic government than a, a Catholic one that is Orthodox is they they didn't like very much. I mean this is a nutshell even the history of mm, great part of the rest of of um, the Orthodox territories that were conquered by the Ottomans, uh, and in fact, this this mm, assessment was would prove to be to be wrong. Um, yet, if the Grand Duke of Tuscany had managed to recover Cyprus, right, uh, he would have proven, uh, in front of all of Europe, Christian Europe, that he could essentially claim the Lusignan legacy. And to be crowned at that point without recovering Jerusalem directly, but still of King of Cyprus, uh, to be crowned King of Cyprus and of Jerusalem in that regard, because the titles at that point, at least the the, the most of uh, those who had held it more, you know, um, more directly up to a few decades ago by right, contemplated the pairing of the two crowns. Right, they went together. Um, the main problem for the Tuscans at this point was actually the Venetians, because uh, those were the last that had controlled the island, actually, right? And uh, Venice was not like the Duke of, uh, of Savoy, right? The Venetians were already, you know, a considerable force, 
and especially at sea, you know, against uh, the Tuscans, it was no match, right? They, they would have, they could have tried even to to retake uh, Cyprus I itself. But it was really, I suspect, really a matter of uh, of of uh, of holding this territory for a while, just being recognized the title, right? It was not really a strategic thinking, right? Uh, per se, right? In the struggle between the Christians and the Muslims in the Mediterranean, it was really about being recognized politically, dynastically, that possession. And that was it, right? And plus, Ferdinand thought that through his diplomatic skills he could have, you know, uh, overcome the obstacles and that even the Venetians would have basically accepted this event. So, the interesting thing is that the Tuscans actually put up this expedition and they, s they sailed for it. Um, that's the, the, they happened in May 1607. Uh, the Tuscan fleet um, uh, set forth at the command of the Admiral Jacopo Ingirami. Um, the fleet counted one galleon, eight galleys and nine vessels known as Bertoni and with a um, landing uh, corps of 1,800 um, marines, of, of infantrymen, actually. Uh, the commander of this enterprise was uh, Antonio de' Medici, that was nephew of, of the same Grand Duke, while the infantry were guided by uh, Francesco Bourbon del Monte, um, uh, that was another fascinating figure of the time, um, and uh, the objective was nonetheless the, the occupation of Famagusta, right? That the spies were ensuring now that would have actually um, been freed thanks to the support of the local Greek population to the Tuscan forces. But on, on that occasion, I mean, you're dealing with the Ottoman Empire, right? At this point, it's not really at the beginning of the 17th century the Ottoman intelligence proved better than one of Tuscany and the defenders of Cyprus were perfectly aware of the plans of the uh, invaders and their artillery actually decimated without mercy the Tuscan columns that had just landed and that had to uh, come back uh, hurriedly on, on board uh, to avoid uh, annihilation right um, and the interesting thing of this is that the Greek population of the island didn't do anything to support the invasion. Um, so this was actually a tragic situation with which the, the commanders even mis misunderstood their orders and uh, it was a complete disaster. Uh, Ferdinand at this point didn't come out in a pretty, you know, favorable light. Uh, he was humiliated by this, but he didn't he didn't give up, and this is to his credit. He reacted immediately to the Cypriot failure, um, and he actually succeeded in another um, in another enterprise. Actually, as in, in September of the same 1607, he managed to capture the city of Annaba in Algeria um, using a fleet that was um, formally. Uh, at the same command of uh, the Admiral Ingirami and of the great constable uh, of the of the St. Stephen's Order, Silvio Piccolomini, but in which, um, under the guide of General Guglielmo Guadagni, more uh, romantically known under the name of Knight of uh, Beauregard, um, there were actually um, pretty skilled um, English and Flemish privateers that were um, actually in service and displaying the insignia of the Grand Duchess Christine, right? That at least at this she decided to to back his husband's goals, and uh, this enterprise was was a, a real success. It actually brought to the capture of fifteen hundred slaves. Uh, it was celebrated in the verses of uh, you know. Piazza and Cabrera, and you know, artists of this time, and um, this, uh, the eco of Annaba um, also favored the, um, you know, the, the penetration, let's say, of the Tuscan intelligence and in, in its relations with the rebels of Aleppo. 
because between the Syrian Pasha Ali Yambulad and Ferdinand uh, the Medici, uh, there was even a plan of alliance that was signed on October the second by the envoys of of the latter. There were uh, Corai and Leoncini. Um, and uh, I this mm, uh, pact uh, was essentially contemplated 30 um, clauses that basically uh, also mm, contemplated the creation of a major league involving uh, the Pope, the King of Spain and the Grand Duke of Tuscany for the restoration of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and also, an also another set of um, agreements of essentially maritime and commercial character. Now this is very interesting because as you understand the same Muslim rebels were favorable in that context to um, actually um, create this the state uh, repristinating effectively Christian rule in Jerusalem itself right that tells you how far religion in this context is just one of the many factors and definitely not the decisive one is this event shows um, and this would have been actually an interesting feat had it been accomplished uh, but the problem was effectively accomplishing it for real right and Jerusalem at that point wasn't faring pretty well as the city was, was declining pretty pretty badly uh, in importance I mean up to you know fairly recent time had been a great important center but at the same at certain times was still of crucial importance for the Ottomans as the holy city right was f you know uh, the, the second sanctuary of the high and uh, that is the Muslim pilgrimage so it was still a center that the Ottomans uh, held quite proudly and would have never give, uh, given up and was also well um, well control I mean defended uh, strategically so um, at the same time the same revolt of um, Ali Yan Bulad was uh, rapidly repressed by the Ottomans um, there was though still Idrud's Emir Fakr ad Din right that was actually very well entrenched over the Lebanese mountains um, and that he controlled also very important ports such as the one of Tyre which represented an important facility even for uh, an eventual Christian landing and if it was in fact in, in that uh, old and noble uh, maritime city that in the spring 1608 um, the Tuscan ambassadors were received by the same Emir Fakr Din who assured them that he was perfectly capable to cope with the Ottoman forces and to conquer Jerusalem albeit he couldn't ensure the Tuscans um, that he could maintain the control of the city for a long time uh, so that the Christians would have had to intervene in some more force uh, so the Tuscans actually replied that um, the the Spanish king and, and the Pope would have you know granted their support albeit the Emir w pretend had some sort of more consistent and immediate grants also because uh, such a, um, an immense effort now considered the, the advantageous strategical situation here uh, er, Lebanon is, is not easy and an easy territory so that place where he could more easily defend uh, offense of Ottoman attacks, but you know the, the conquest of Jerusalem w wasn't also such uh, such a light enterprise. Um, he demanded especially weapons, naval support, and especially a safe conduct that um, uh, could grant uh, him to visit, let's say, in uh, at his um, at his will. Uh, his uh, Grand Ducal ally, that is to say that he could effectively take refuge in Italy had things gone wrong or at least that you know he could receive more uh, more direct uh, could appeal more directly to to the Christian forces so th all this was happening I in a situation in in, in some long time uh, after all since in 1609 Cosimo II succeeded to his father Ferdinand 
uh, the first and therefore taking on his shoulders the prosecution of his parents uh, ambitious program right and uh, the first diplomatic act um, in, in, in this sense was receiving the Persian embassy sent by Shah Abbas um, that uh, on, the, in, on the Ottoman front had actually been defeated now and was trying actually to desperately to obtain that his Christian interlocutors could intervene directly with the Ottoman Sultan uh, attacking him from the Danube from from the Adriatic and this would have naturally uh, lightened up the, the pressure on, on Persia. During the 17th century, we'll make it maybe see it better in another video, uh, there were pretty intense diplomatic relations, especially between the Habsburgs um, uh, of Austria, if I'm not wrong, I mean more than maybe the ones of Spain or even other, like the Italian powers, for um, yeah, for coordination actually, in fighting uh, uh, on on different fronts at the same time, just to to sp to oblige the Ottomans to split forces, and together with this came all uh, even an awareness of these peoples that you know uh, didn't know so well each other. That now even you know we're getting fascinated even culturally um, by each other. What is interesting is is that in this embassy, uh, Cosimo the Second the Medici. Um, um, received as an embassy uh, as a, an envoy of the Persian Emperor the Count Robert Shirley that was brother of Antony uh, that was essentially an English uh, con uh, advi military advisors uh, advisor that had been sent to Persia in order to modernize the Shah's uh, uh, for army um, this is interesting because actually plenty of these people. I mean, between the 17th and the 18th century, also the Ottoman Empire will benefit enormously from uh, a lot of European uh, military advisors that went uh, from countries like France, like Germany, to, to actually leave in the Ottoman Empire, to convert um, and leave there for, you know, so selling their services as military advisors. And these centuries are all but a moment of military stagnation. Many people think that the Ottoman Empire at this point was declining qualitatively and technologically. Absolutely false. This is absolutely false for anybody who has even the slightest knowledge about that period. But still on manuals. But Historians keep repeating this stuff. I don't. I sincerely don't know why, because it's one of those things that is so simple to check out that I don't know why uh, there is still this cliche. Um, but this naturally shows that, that there was an interest in this case, even from Persia. You know that Persia was somewhat more military conservative, even that the Ottomans. I mean, the, the Ottomans among the Muslim powers were the the most dramatically and radically westernized of all of them. Right? They adopted pretty quickly. Um, uh, artillery. They they started fighting, you know, with orderly lines of musketeers. You know, there was this, um, in well, the Persians came from. Think about the Battle of Calderan, right? Uh, there was still this mindset of uh, somewhat horse archery, this chivalric uh, culture uh, of Iran that was deeply influenced also by the, the Central Asian ones and the steppes, much more than than the Ottomans. that now were basically European. Um, in military culture, but aside from this, um, there was also another episode that tells you how this, you know, how flamboyant and uh, picturesque the 17th century is, and how even the continuity of the Middle Ages lives on, in many ways. Since um, uh, there was another character, a, a pretty weird one that arrived in Florence, uh, there was the very young Prince Yahya. Right, that he qualified himself, like I said, satisfactorily so, as the third son of the deceased Ottoman Sultan Mehmed the Third, um, and therefore, as a consequence, given you know this alleged uh, relationship, the relation, the uh, elderly brother of the current Ottoman Sultan Ahmed the um, First. So you understand what this meant. He had arrived now. Uh, to uh, to in Italy claiming the, this uh, legitimacy on on, on the uh, alleged brother's son, and he claimed all these legions like that he uh, he had been saved by his own mother was a Greek originally 
uh, Christian one by the name of Helena, uh, you know, uh, quite ev evocative name, that is uh, Helena Komnena, right, that is even more, because it's uh, Constantine's, like, Constantine's mother, and, like, the, the Komnenians of, um, of, of, of the, the former uh, Byzantine Ro Roman Empire, um, as the Ottomans themselves actually boasted this descendancy from true dynastic line that existed actually back in the day between the Komnenians and this um, emirs of the uh, of the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum. Um, so very complicated story. Also, it were not dramatically documented on them, but I mean there, there were also everything was possible there like in these this idea that you could be a legitimate son and not recognize all these plots right that actually reflect more than else the interpreting your reality of the political thought of the time it was still possible uh, theoretically now to set up these great expeditions to overthrow the sultan and to um and um and surprise surprise in fact now this Yahya was not a Muslim anymore because he had uh, arrived to Greece uh, along his way and he had been, uh, al al according, al according to him, hidden and protected by some monks that had al also baptized him. So all the story now, he was a Christian, he was claiming uh, to be a the brother of, th of the Ottoman Emperor. The idea is, uh, let's overthrow Ahmed the first and let's, you know, Christianize the whole Ottoman Empire. Fine. Um, so, the, the Medici at this point were somewhat skeptical about the possibility, you know, let's say, of a, constru you know, of a positive outcome of, of the alliance with, with Persia, because Iran was somewhat too far. Uh, in that regard, while this guy, Yahya, um, seemed to be, you know, at least more, more expandable, um, he uh, thought that he could be counterposed to the reigning Ottoman Sultan, assassinating uh, this sort of civil war, if not a general war, um, uh, at least in some of the most uh, troubled and uh, uh, turbulent regions of the Ottoman Empire, uh, and that therefore, the, as a bit as it had happened, like two more than two centuries before, when the pri Christian powers had backed the Prince Sam, that was the the brother of Bayezid the second, right? So, the Great Duke, by by the Grand Duke, by this time, um, uh, sought the help of Venice, right? They asked to. Uh, Asdrubale Montauti, that was essentially the Venetian ambassador in Florence, um, to you know to accept this crusade plan that could exploit also the fact that the Sultan now was actually committed effectively I in the war against Persia. But from Venice, they they answered not. Basically, they, they were not interested. Um, nor Yahya seemed to be more fortunate in that sense because. Uh, he landed in the spring of 1610 with this good um, Tuscan novel escort on the Lebanese shores. Um, and he was um, hosted yet coldly by Fakr ad Din, uh, who uh, essentially uh, revealed to this prince that it wasn't feasible to to trigger like a civil war within the Ottoman Empire just on claim certain claims on the throne like the ones the were was, was boasting um, and as a consequence uh, Yaya came back after a few months to Livorno with a fleet that um, had accompanied him and he resided in Tuscany up to 1614. Um, and he went away um, because um, at that same point, actually Fakr ad Din had decided to, uh, you know, to exploit his safe conduct and uh, enjoying this Tuscan holiday. Actually, as he was um, uh, hosted by Cosimo II himself, who became a close friend of his, right? 
is kind of interesting. The Grand Duke of Tuscany hacked the movements of anti-Ottoman revolt in the Near uh, East between September 1609 and April 1611. Um, a fleet of the Order of St. Stephen had uh, once again um, uh, went, uh, gone into the waters of the Levantine Sea and uh, during this expedition the encounters with the emissaries of the of, uh, of Fakhr al-Din had revealed the existence of a precise plan. The Grand Duke also hosted the Emir Fakhr al-Din when he took refuge in the West to escape the Ottoman Sultan. Right, uh, The Emir had actually bravely fought and he had yet to, to abandon his land on November the 3rd, uh, 1613, he had um, sailed uh, for from uh, from Sidon and had uh, landed in uh, Livorno on a Flemish ship with around 70 people with him. And, and we are well documented about the visit of the Druze Emir in Tuscany because um, he um, basically dictated a sort of diary to his biographer Al Khalidi and therefore we know about all his travels around Tuscany for example at Pisa at the Ambrogiana Villa uh, in Florence at the Impruneta um, then even uh, again in, in, um, in Livorno actually to rejoin with his wife that uh, came from um, by sea I, I presume as well. Uh, then he went to Pisa again, and then to Florence uh, again, when he even participated to the carnival, right? And it seems that Fakr ad-Din literally fell in love with Florentine culture so much that he even had this um, a, a reproduced, basically, uh, I don't know how much result, but the, the famous Garden of Boboli, one of his Outremer uh, holdings, and Cosimo the second and uh, Fakr ad Din actually resumed the project of, of crusade, if you want the dream that had been in Ferdinand at the first, that is to reconquer Jerusalem yet again. And many Florentines that were among the Knights of Malta, uh, that, that, as you know, the Ioannites came from all over Europe, right? Is a um, and they en encouraged actually this, um, uh, you know, this purpose, right? I, I the, the idea is, of course, that the thing had remained, it even possibly grown to be more uh, something just a bit less than fantasy, right? Um, and um, it seems that, especially uh, Giovanni de' Medici, Don Giovanni de' Medici, that was actually the natural son of uh, Cosimo I. Um, and he was at, at the time actually very um, authoritative and listened to uh, at the court. Um, wanted to, you know, to, to insisted essentially um, in in this idea of uh, even think about the symbolism and this transferring the sacellum of the Holy Sepulchre itself, the Holy Sepulchre of Christ. Uh, from Jerusalem to Florence, right, to basically reassemble it uh, at the center of the funerary chapel of the Grand Dukes of Tuscany in the Church of St. Lawrence in Florence. So, under this great cupola that had been conceived by uh, the same Don Giovanni de' Medici and by the architect Righetti that were inspire, inspired of the to the same uh, Jerusalemian anastasis, right, where the, the sepulchre is, is contained, and, and uh, telling the truth, uh, this seems in fact so picturesque, and there is not even a true historical documentation that proves the uh, the historical reality of these plans, right? Uh, it's uh, first of all, it was very difficult, but it seems as if it was rather a, a legion that was formed afterwards from from this milieu in which the, the thing was, was thought and uh, fantasized, but nobody really can assess whether this 
actually happened at the time was a serious thinking as it instead the the expedition the Cyprus in 1607 had uh, had been Fakr ad-Din remained um, for a long time in Tuscany uh, he was a test subject for these maritime and slash military uh, plans but nothing was really carried out in the end but uh, at least there is to say that his presence in Tuscany actually had an important consequence for the um, in the art in the taste of the time think that uh, one of the very first episodes of um, Orientalism in the European theater the so-called dance of the Turkish women uh, was staged in fact in, in Florence um, on Marc de Gras of uh, 1615 right by Gironi with m the music of uh, the Galliano um, and all these things and uh, interestingly enough uh, the same factor at the Dean um, uh, granted in Nazareth at some point the uh, foundation of the Franciscan Church dedicated to Mary with the in fact of the settlement of um, minor friars on the Mount Tabor right this is particularly fascinating also because this happened when uh, the same factor then had come back to Lebanon and uh, he actually ended up to be uh, killed by uh, the Ottoman Sultan in 1635 so there was actually this cultural exchange right be between um, between Tuscany and Syria uh, in at uh, this time uh, even an interreligious discourse as you understand uh, the Druzes are a very particular mystic uh, community that have a predisposition even but th this fascination that existed um, for from you know the oriental traditions in Europe and also for the the European traditions in the Near East uh, is very important right and considering that th all these back and forth on the Mediterranean these expeditions brought sometimes uh, constantly to to warfare right um, for example in 1608 one of these um, uh, Tuscan um, expeditions crossed uh, in the Gulf of Adalia um, um, a convoy of four roughly 40 vessels of Muslim pilgrims that were directed to Mecca and they obtained a, an enormous booty from them um, and the, the, all this stuff is documented should be maybe for researched further because it shows how uh, still how permeable right uh, before the you know the, the creation of the nation state that these world wars uh, actually were I mean this possibility is that we think by the 17th century being irrealistic and fantasy like but th the only fact that they were thought and that were even attempted and that still there was a, l a lot of movement definitely the Mediterranean this constant privateering adventures mindset even that is typical of the Baroque era and of the um, of the same uh, you know also aristocratic military culture of the time right it, it's it's very um, functional even to those moments policies and this great clash was occurring uh, that as you understand is not merely Christians vers versus Muslims as in this case uh, as we've seen it's it's very 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 different um, but at the same point um, I think this is also another interesting look at what the strategic potentials of the times the naval projection capabilities effectively were right not considering the, the Mediterranean either as like one half was Ottoman one other was Christian but a, a constant interplay that left open, open a lot of options a lot of um, experimentations that you see in the case of Cyprus failed but they, they actually happen right and they were they never really come to an end and the even the farsightedness of these uh, rulers to attempt um, still this great participation in the Crusades uh, what is I try to stress also talking about Crusades in, in other periods is, is realizing that after 1291 so the fall baker really brought to the end of the crusader spirit of ideal.
right? Uh, the Westerners roamed around the Near East, Turkey all the time, right? There wasn't uh, really um, a moment in which this thing ended. Um, this presence was always there. This uh, constant, um, uh, you know, this great highway that water represents, even from a sheer logistical point of view, I mean, it's easy to travel by sea, especially in the Mediterranean, where you can do really a lot of things now. Naval engineering is, is developing fast as well in this time. I mean, there are lots of things we'll have to look at um, in this series, and I think it can be uh, very, very mind opening in, in many ways in a period that we tend to ignore completely. Like, I realize that even from the videos I make, that you know, there are certain topics that are always like people click and like, right? If it's Roman history, Byzantine history, everybody click, 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 click. I, I get this from the analytics in an incredible way. Even if you start talking about Western Middle Ages or from not talking about modern warfare, people seemingly don't care but this stuff was really cool right you can't say you know I, I like just that because uh, you I don't know it, it's as if th there is a prejudice behind that and wherever there is a prejudice there is also a mis uh, assessment a misjudgment uh, by definition so I would like to open uh, to to increase awareness on a lot of issues that I mean, s I, I see sometimes on YouTube someone that uh, tries to do the same thing, but it seems it's always very basic. Like it gets to the to the essentials or to certain things that are, yeah, maybe curious, but that are somewhat still mainstream. That if you have looked at, I don't know, disclosure, you know, uh, bi bibliography in English, you it's in on English publications, it's fairly unknown stuff but even in there someone who tries to frame this whole thing in the broader historical political uh, military social scenario I it's difficult and he said I think we should recover that systemic awareness about the world because these periods are very very useful in my opinion even to to understand better what is going to be like in the next years like we have lived for couple of centuries more or less um, remaining fixed to certain standards certain you know parameters that seem to us would never change or at least we're going towards a progressive direction if you study the Middle Ages but even the early modern age by, by and large you see this enormous complication of reality that uh, if you don't get used to to frame correctly you you can't even understand today's world Right, because the the the, bar the boundaries are fluidifying, right? The situation is going to grow seriously more messed up than than before, right? It's over the days in which we thought um, infinite growth, uh, always better. No, we will have to deal with lots of problems that are primarily really political, military, social, and and these um, historical episodes help us to to get used to the idea that the wolf thing is pretty damn complicated there's not there, there's not a simple answer that there is not as uh, you know uh, really something that is um, unimportant to know that you can approximate so superficially so that's also why I talk about this stuff and we will go on with this but uh, for now I I st uh, stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video, if you did please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time, bye.